you can look at the desert from afar and I think barren is often an adjective people misplace when they describe the desert. They say it's barren. But as you really start to see the desert and look at it, you start to see where all the life lies in it. And that's something that I think is this really powerful metaphor about the desert in ways we assume from the visuals. Welcome to the Desert Lady Diaries podcast, conversations with women who have found their home in the Mojave Desert. I'm Dawn Davis, and this is episode 142. To find out more about the podcast, go to DesertLadyDiaries.com and engage with the guests, with listeners, or with me on Facebook and Instagram at Desert Lady Diaries. With more than two decades as a teaching artist, Taria Autry has inspired, supported, and showcased tens of thousands of students' creative expression. Her poetry collection, Roots, Reality, and Rhyme, bridges the personal and political, the mythic and the real, and set the stage for her theatrical, multimedia, one-woman show. A fierce advocate of independent publishing, she has produced several collections of her own poetry, including Poetic License in 2020. In January of 2020, Taria participated in Joshua Tree Live, a popular spoken word fundraiser for the local nonprofit Miltree. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for inviting me to be a part of this. I'm really excited to, yeah. uh, to join you today. Thank you. And I guess what we should say at the outset is you are calling me from Florida. Yes, I have recently relocated to the Tampa area in Florida. I'm, I'm just out side of Tampa. A recent move from the desert environment to a very wet tropical um, environment. So yes, pretty far extremes. Absolutely. <laughs> but still warm and still sunny. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I remember about Florida. I spent some time there myself, I think between 2006 and 2011 or 12 when I moved to LA and I was out in um, Northeast of Orlando, but still just as humid and hot, yeah. <laughs> but lovely. You know, it's like you're on vacation every day. <laughs> yeah. I try to embrace it as that. Right. Yes. <laughs> what was your first experience with desert? In thinking about my first experience with desert, it's really a story about a way that I reconnected with my mother. My mother was a, a hard worker. She raised me as a single parent and often worked multiple jobs. I have childhood memories of, you know, there's the weekend sitter, the evening daycare, the day day. I have those memories of what that was of having a, a mother working a lot of the time. So she wasn't someone who was taking a lot of vacations. And when she did, one of the things that she loved was Vegas. And so that was this mythic story of my childhood was on oh, Vegas, even without having been there, or even knowing much about it. It just held this space in my mind, like through this connection with my mother, as far as it being this one place. She didn't talk about, oh, one day I want to go live on an island or, oh, I want to travel to Tahiti. But Vegas, she's like, oh man, if I could just get back to Vegas. What that says about her personality, I'm not exactly sure. Right. Um, what did but, she do when she went to Vegas? Did she gamble at the casinos or did she just spend time in the desert? Honestly, we didn't have detailed, detailed conversations. I know that Circus Circus, and mind you, this is a different era to the modern day. Circus Circus was one of her favorite spots to go to. And there's this story of somebody who was inappropriately either flirting with her or in her personal space, and she punched them, like knocked them out. And so there's something about that in my mind, too. Like, imagine my mom, who people are listening in the listening audience. It's not like they're going to see what I look like. But I identify as Black. I'm African-American. I am biracial. My mother was white. And for people who knew my mother from outside of close family, if you saw her, I kind of joked that she was kind of like super leave it to beaver, button up. You wouldn't even assume. And she liked it that way. Her name was Kathy Smith. And she loved that, that kind of anonymity that that provided. That also is part of this idea around Vegas too. It's like, my mom has this other adult life that I can only imagine where she punched some guy out, where, you know, she goes and gambles and like it's glamorous and, oh, Vegas is a place where maybe you could win it big. Even when she couldn't go to Vegas, she was a person who would every once in a while buy lottery tickets, nothing really excessive. Or she would go to casinos, get their different reservations and whatnot. When uh, my mom passed away in January of 2007, when it came around to the three-year anniversary of her passing, I just knew she wouldn't want me to just sit around and cry and be sad. I was like, how could I really just honor my mom? And I chose to go to Vegas, which wasn't really something on my list of like, ooh, 
Vegas. But I was like, I'm going to go because that's what my mom loves. And that was my first trip to the desert. And it was really fun. Uh, I went with a good friend. You know, we partied, made a toast, made a toast to my mom at, at Circus Circus. And, and then I realized, oh, this is why she always wanted to come back because it is fun. People watching, it's like an adult Disneyland kind of vibe. People have been to Vegas. So that was my first experience. And then that became the sort of touchstone of, okay, I was really stressed out at my job you know what, I just need to get away. I'm going to go to Vegas. And so the second time I went, I went actually to the Grand Canyon and started to really see the land and the desert more. And I ended up going there and returning, you know, a few times. And on my third trip, I did a bus tour where I traveled to Bryce Canyon, Zion, Antelope Canyon. We went to the Grand Canyon, Monument Valley, it was breathtaking. It was like this whirlwind three day. Death in the desert. Yeah. Yes. And it was so just transforming. So there were these various ways that the desert had kind of found me and reached out to me, even though I hadn't planned for it to, right? And then in that same trip, actually, I ended up meeting my partner who I'm with now. And so he and I met um, actually in Vegas, which is so random. So I, I found love in the desert, everybody. That's what the desert is about. The desert is about love. Maybe for some maybe, people, but yeah. maybe not for everyone. And I'm not saying or, like everyone. Or could. if we could probably say it's about various <laughs> kinds of love, finding yeah. some people come here and find more love for themselves. They may find a partner. They may right. find love for the environment. There is Exactly. That. You know, and our paths collided and, you know, we met there and then I ended up moving where he was and he he was a marine he just recently retired and so I started kind of trekking around with him so I ended up in North Carolina in Jacksonville and after like kind of couch surfing and visiting different places from leaving the northwest and then he got orders to 29 Palms and I grew up in California in Monterey Bay and so I was familiar with California but I have to be really honest and say that I had never heard of 29 Palms. And so I started preparing for the desert because I was, you know, obviously right away you realize, okay, it's the desert and that's very different. I stopped reading about all the poisonous things because that's not good. It's not a good look. <laughs> don't do that. No. Don't, don't. I, I will be honest. That was one of my big things. I still shake my shoes out. I will always do that for life. You know, there's some things that are a little different, but you know, I was trying to prepare myself. You know, you look at it on the map and the thing that really caught me right away as an artist, no disrespect, speck of a map counts. Yeah. I mean, Monterey growing up, unless you're like really a Steinbeck fan and like these other historical things, like that's a speck on the map town. It just happens to be in a you know, really cool location. But the desert's like that too, right? So I'm looking and I'm going, oh wait, but look at, they have a whole art gallery tour and there's all these galleries throughout this basin. So I'm starting to kind of look at this whole, it's not just 29 Palms. It's not just Yucca. It's this Morongo Basin. It's Inland Empire. So you start to kind of widen that scope into you know, what is this area of the desert? And as an artist, I was like, oh, there's going to be art. Because when you see that many art galleries, just in a cursory glance, and they have a month, monthly thing in a series that has a long standing, you know that that's just a sign. It's like the tip of the iceberg, right? And you know there's other things that yeah. trickle down from that. In coming to the desert, I knew I wasn't going to quite know what to expect, but I was ready to embrace what I knew would be art community. And that's always been a good way to find home as a slam poet, as a touring poet, having slept on random couches and been in weird places. You know, the open mic may or may not be great, but you're going to find your people. That's what the arts do. So it'll work out. And I ended up just missing some big theater festivals because we came right in July, towards the end of summer. So we were settling in right when some things were happening. It would have been cool, but I didn't make it. And one of those things was uh, Mary Hunter, was doing a performance and it was part of this big theater festival. And I was like, oh, I really would like to go to that. But, you know, life happens. I didn't quite make it. And then there was a Inland Empire Art Council. That like might, the that Arts might be, Connection? Yeah. And they had this weekend thing at the community college. And I was like, well, let me go find my people and let me go see what the art scene is here. Because as a teaching artist, you always want to you know, how can I get into schools and work with the youth and things like that? And I also saw that Mary was going to be presenting. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Because, you know, I kind of want to know what she's doing. You know, as a woman of color, I'm always curious, you know, what are women of color and what are they doing? And ended up meeting her. And 
it wasn't immediate, but over time I stage managed a production she was doing and then acted in a few. And so just started getting connected in the desert. You, you know, that thing that you enjoy, you start doing it and looking into it and you start to meet those like-minded people. And then and being in productions and working with Mary, one of the actors that I met, Kurt, who, you know, works with the newspaper. After working with me and getting to know like, oh, you have a, a writing master's. Would you want to write for the paper? Because, you know, you know, and so like we have this conversation and I'm thinking, well, yeah, you know, I've done stuff like that before. Sure. You know, want to kind of get to know the town and get out and meet people and what a perfect way to really get to know the community. And it forces you to talk to people, to go to things where you'd be like, oh yeah, maybe I'll go to that. And with this, it's like, actually, could you cover that? So I needed to be there. So I thought, oh, this will be a good way for me to get to know the town. And so I started working with the regional newspaper, the High Desert Star, Desert Trail. And then they do the quarterly home magazine that they put out as well. So through that, I was at the high school. So then that was a fun way where I wasn't doing curriculum. I was actually going in and interviewing high school students or talking to teachers or going to the church event, various fundraisers, art openings, and talking with the artists. So just fit into all these other things that I did. And it was a great way to meet people. And you realize, which I think is similar to the scenery of the desert, you can look at the desert from afar. And I think barren is often an adjective people misplace when they describe the desert. They say it's barren. But as you you really start to see the desert and look at it, you start to see where all the life lies in it. And that's something that I think is this really powerful metaphor about the desert in ways we assume from the visuals. Because just, you know, I'd sit in my backyard and watch all the different things that would scurry. I had my roadrunner friends that came by and visited pretty regularly. Rabbits, hummingbirds, so many things that are eking out this existence. So even though you can say this is this harsh reality, this habitat for so many things that have made it everything they needed to be. So there's something about that that's really cool. And I remember in that three-day tour when we were traveling through different First Nations as well, and you know they were sharing with us the wisdom of how they captured water, right? By And one method was tying like these strings. And don't quote me on this. I'm not trying to say in any way like I'm some expert. But there was a way that they did strings or ropes down the sides, the walls of the, the rock. Oh, wow. And so the condensation gathers and starts to work its way down into whatever form of a bucket or way that they were capturing it. And you think, right, because there's water here. And that maybe was not the method everywhere, but in this particular location in Monument Valley, one of our guides was explaining that, who was, you know, a native of the Navajo Nation, and was explaining this was one of the techniques. And you start to go, right, because there's life everywhere. So I think having that true appreciation and respect for how things shape us, how we are shaped by the world in which we live. As someone who grew up by ocean, whether it was Seattle, mm -hmm. to being in the Monterey Bay area, also inlet, lots of water. Portland, rivers, rivers, rivers. So the desert is a really extreme shift. And I think I thought that that was going to be, I worried it would be harsh. Or I wondered, well, what is that going to be like? And then you go through like Joshua Tree National Park or the huge rock formations. Everywhere you turn, there's so much beauty and amazingness. And, you know, and folks that have decided that there's something about being a little outside the box, a little off the beaten path that was a choice for whatever reason that they made. So that yeah. creates this interesting mixture of people, you know, folks that I got tired of LA, they have these backgrounds that, you know, you see them and you're just like, oh, that's just the regular person going to the local grocery store. But you don't even know like how many albums they put out, how many movies they produce, what they have going. And there's that part of that life is really fascinating too. Like, and I think one of the questions that you had posed that you had sent was talking about kind of like, why is it that people end up in the desert? And, you know, for me, I was, in a relationship with someone I loved who got sent there by the government to 29 Palms. There was no like set choice. Like that wasn't on the agenda. Well, honey, move to desert. But it ended up being so wonderful. And I would say, while I had never thought I would choose to live in the desert, you know, people always go, oh, one day I'd love to have a beach house. Mm -hmm. That's like this kind of typical, stereotypical kind of like dream. You know, I get it. I get why people settle in the desert, get land there and just want to be there. It, the tranquility, the quiet, the night skies. There's so much to embrace. The mountains, now being in Florida, such an extreme contrast. It's very flat. flat. But also just lush, tropical. I'm by a lake and rivers and so much water. Like everywhere there's water, water, water. So it's great to have experienced the two extremes. But I would say that the desert calls me. Like I didn't 
expect for the desert to leave such a big mark on me if you had asked me when I was younger. I would have always said I'm an ocean child. And having spent time in the desert and living there for a couple of years, even in small, out of the way, dead end street that we were on by Chocolate Drop Mountain, I could wake up and look out my front door when I lived there to Chocolate Drop Hill and walk up there and just sit and you just, you can't beat it. And there were all these little places like that. Times I would just pull off the side of the road because we got those rains and then there would be the blossoms and all the flowers. And then, wow, the magnificence of it. So I think a lot of times the desert is underrated and people don't realize um, what they miss by not checking it out more. I did learn something. Tell me. Water. Whatever you thought was enough water is not. And I always have it on you. Mm. And it seems so obvious. <laughs> but it isn't any more obvious until the time you go on a bike ride. And I had a backpack, water, camel pack, and I had a water bottle. I don't think I had a second water bottle. But you know, you think that should be good. But I ended up taking a wrong turn and getting lost. And there's no shade. That's the thing about the desert. There's no shade. Palm trees don't offer shade. So I literally was doing a mantra to myself. You can do it. You're almost there. You can do it. You can do it. Because I realized there was no place for me to like pull over into the shade and just rest for a minute to like cool down Mm -hmm. because there was no shade anywhere. I was out of water and I knew I still had a little ways to go. I mean, and this wasn't like a 20 mile trip. That was my first time realizing like, oh, this is how people die (laughs) in the desert (laughs) in a really real way. Because I was like, I have to keep going because if I don't, this is how it starts. Right. And I mean, you know, I have to knock on someone's door and I'm like, I don't know any, you know, I don't know these people. You got to take it serious. Respect the desert. Just like the ocean. You got to respect the ocean. Don't take it lightly. It's a powerful entity that has its own period. It just has its own. So that's one lesson. The other lesson is like quiet and the appreciation of solitude in a way that was really unique. Because that sort of isolation, it felt like we all chose it. Like we all chose this out of the way life. So there was something peaceful in that. And so I think that's something that that environment offers. Like what is it to not have a bunch of noise? Sometimes I'm still looking around like, what is that? Because people mowing their lawns. Right. (laughs) (laughs) That noise. You never hear a lawnmower in the desert. (laughs) It's in Palm Springs. (laughs) Right. Because that's very different. It's very different. Right. Yeah. Um, I really learned to be still yeah. and sit and watch because to see things in the desert, that's a lot of what you have to do is just sit and be still and then you start to see it. And I think that really has set me up for some interesting epiphanies and quiet moments. And I just feel really thankful for the people that I met while I was there that I got to collaborate with. The creativity of it is just abundant. I worked on a, you know, a couple of small movies and saying worked on, meaning that I went to a random reading of the script, or maybe I shot one random scene that may or may not even make it in. But, you know, that part isn't so relevant as getting to hang out with all these folks that are like, you know what, independently, I've started my own theater production company, or independently, I'm do my own filmmaking like and that's all over because you have to do that because there aren't all these markets there there aren't a lot of businesses there and that's the one thing I think that was made it hard to stay for us in particular I teach online currently so I was able to maintain work but to really career retire settle I I think depending on what you do where you are I think some people maybe once they have something established, then they can find it easier to settle there. But that part can be hard. And that's true throughout the country, throughout so many locations. So the desert doesn't like hold that on their own. If that's common. That was something that I noticed. But at the same time, you know, I was in a whole bunch of plays. I got um, nominated for some ovation. Things like that is pretty great. I think in a different city, in a different format, I don't know that I would have done as much theater. If I had been in, say, L.A., would I have felt comfortable, you know, with comfort? It was like, oh, these are cool people. It's it's fun to hang out. And not to in any way discredit the talent. I'm not saying it that way. More just like it didn't feel like that cutthroat kind of vibe because I'm not not into that, which is why, like, with slam poetry, I just was never super, super competitive. I like the camaraderie. And so that camaraderie was, like, right away. And I think that aspect I really felt. And just knowing 
there were just these wide communities of people doing cool stuff and that I got to sort of jump in and because I had been in plays, but you know, like Streetcar Named Desire to be able to like, I was in Streetcar Named Desire. That was pretty awesome. Because there aren't a lot of people that can do that sort of thing here. It allows for maybe some non-traditional casting. I mean, a woman Mm -hmm. played Stanley. And that's right. To see, you know, Anne play Stanley. Oh, it was fantastic. There's just this way that independent things can often flourish when large things don't have as big of a monopoly that limits and squeezes out that competition sometimes. So I felt like really fortunate that there were ways that I got to really grow in kind of nurturing. Not that there wasn't competition, but you know, and where there, I found communities where I could be nurtured and have friends and collaborate because I do love to collaborate with others. Yeah. I'm going to switch gears for a little bit. And I looked at some things on your website and I found a quote, so I'm going to read it. Oppression looks different to everyone. Activism looks different to everyone. We all have to find our way in the world, but there are ways as a collective where elements of our experience are similar. Hmm. Yeah. Can you expand on that for just a minute? So as someone who teaches on the college level, I do a lot of work around identity, race, class, gender, and study different moments in history and the interlocking oppressions shape experience, how different forms of oppression are systemic, how history, as you study it, and we talk about how it repeats itself, but as you study it, you really see it. I can see how so many of us are in these similar situations and how we can come together. I think some of it also stems from being a bridge in so many ways. As an artist, as an educator, having grown up as a bridge between families, as a biracial child born in the early 70s, my family was very separate. Mm. And I grew up understanding why that was. So like this idea of race wasn't something I didn't figure out later, like really early on. You know, that's why we aren't as close. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, like, so there's these things you kind of catch early about race when you see it dividing your own family, right? And then there's also the way you love your family. Even through that, there's still love. And so I think there's this way that I I tend to hold space. So there's a lot of things going on right now that are detrimental to everybody on the planet. And while we're having this discussion around Black Lives Matter and what does it mean to say Black Lives Matter and who agrees with saying it and what people think it means and there's the interpretation, but the, the reality is what is it to value all life? And as we're not valuing black life, then you can't say you're valuing any other life. And we've seen the repercussions that that's had. So that's the history part, right? So when we look at being, this is going to get a little heavier. I hope that's okay. okay. So when we look at being in this current situation, which is a really clear rape culture, very misogynistic culture, a very racist culture where white supremacy is like flaring up all over, that violence on all those fronts was not only enabled, it was not only encouraged, it was legal for hundreds of years in this country to not value a whole group of people as human beings. So there isn't like some magical day that everybody wakes up And now, oh, we're all human beings. That's the history we're really pushing through is our history as a species Mm -hmm. to feel that somehow some people deserve a quality of life at the detriment of other people not having it. It's like the human condition, conditional flaw, right? So we're all in this together. So like I can see something like these last four years, and I'm thankful that Hopefully, because as this is being recorded, we're still waiting for the results to be solidified. But it's more than just these four years. I feel like when you do a detox, right, they warn people when you detox. There's stuff in there that you don't realize is in there. And so you got to drink a lot of water. You might want to have a doctor on board. You don't just dive into a fast and a detox without prepping and being prepared and doing some research, right? So I feel like right now, all that stuff bubbles up. And if you're not prepared for how it bubbles up, you're going to freak out because you didn't realize you were toxic. And I feel like it's been bubbling up and now it's not in one spot. It's all over. Yeah. And everybody has to see it. And I think for the longest, people were spraying their Febreze over here, you know, lighting their incense over here, closing their blinds. Yeah. I don't have to. All of what's happening now is not truly new. No, it's just a brighter it's, light is shining on it right now yeah. for everyone. Right. And so I think this idea of, you know, we're all in this together 
but we all suffer together. So oftentimes we're talking about what are the traumatic, cyclical, intergenerational effects and impacts mm. of the institution of slavery. And you could say that for all the various forms of violent oppression throughout the world. I'm not trying to say slavery has the sole lock on screwing generations of people up for centuries. Obviously, there's been drastic stuff all over the world. But this reality of like, we look at those who suffered under it and like, well, what does that mean for them? But we often don't deal with the psychology of what about the folks who wielded the violence mm -hmm. and the intergenerational yeah. ways that that moves mm -hmm. through people? Yeah. Why is it that people can see something like current, you know, we're framing it around George Floyd, but that really it's around a systemic reality of injustice. But what is it? Some people can look and ask a question, what did he do first? Rather than ask, what makes someone decide to inflict harm on someone else? in a situation where there is no particular set need to do so is like kind of the kindest way I can, can yeah. say that, right? Really, we could say what makes somebody murder somebody. But then that comes back to this history of hundreds of years of, you know, whether it's colonialism, the great expansion and manifest destiny, and, you know, all these different things happening all over the world. And that's where I say as a species, maybe we're going to work it out because we're going to together. So I find it unfortunate that some people feel that they benefit somehow mm. as long as others don't have. I never say to myself, I want to see Black people have better pay, better housing. I do say that. I do want Black people to have better pay, better housing. But I never say, I want to see that, but I don't want that group to have it. When I say that, you know, I don't care where a person was born, whether or not they were born in this country or some in another country and ended up here, they are a living human being and they have inalienable rights that they should have housing, they should have access to education, they should be able to eat, they should be able to take care of their family. Those are, I think, human rights. I don't think that anyone should be denied that for any reason. I don't think people should have to be homeless. I don't think people should have to be hungry. I don't think people should have to go in debt to go to college. And now that's getting framed as being some leftist, liberal, anarchist. Socialist. <laughs> socialist. And, you know, I'm just saying what I want for myself, I happily want for everyone else. So am I really upset with people who are really propagating this racist, divisive language and utilizing this Trump persona as the vehicle for it, as if somehow clamoring onto that will better their station? When we know that the vast majority of people in poverty in this country are white, just by the nature of the majority of people in this country being still currently for a few more years white. So the reality is, is that when we say we don't want welfare, we don't want to give handouts, really what we're saying is we don't want white women and their white children or their children in general to have food because that's the predominant group, right? So that's not rooting for you. No. Saying we're going to decimate social security, not only do I want you to have your social security, I want you to not have to worry about health care costs ever. You just pay the taxes you pay. They go to the thing so that you're taken care of. I want that for everyone. So for me, it's just this really complex because I don't think people understand that when you start setting up divisions of who can and can't have, you set yourself up. And then it propagates this idea that we have now of a really small ruling class where the majority of people don't have, but we're infighting. Because, you know, a lot of people throughout the country that are living in poverty have been really trained, brainwashed, conditioned, systemically, things that aren't useful to them. Bootstraps meritocracy is not useful. If there are only a handful of jobs that pay not just a livable wage, but a thriving wage. Right. When you I know, hear people saying, oh, we need to raise the minimum wage to $15, I'm like, $15? Could you live on $15 an hour? Think, think about that for real. Right. And what does it harm me if I'm comfortable and I have what I need? What does it harm me for someone who is maybe in a role that our society has decided does not deserve more than $15 an hour. What does it hurt me for them to get a supplemental universal income on top of that? Because you know, yeah, working that takeout restaurant isn't you know, gonna be a 50K job, but you know who we all need right now? You, and you matter. Yeah. That's really what we're, we're saying. So in saying Black Lives Matter isn't, it really is saying like, if you don't acknowledge that, then all the rest 
is, is missing as well. I think it was Neely Fuller, a black psychologist who had said that, and this is not an exact quote, but you know, basically failing to recognize racism, then everything else will only confuse you. And now I'm gonna have to look and make sure I got the right person and the right quote, but this idea that if you don't actually understand the way that racism is functioning in our society, nothing else is gonna make sense because it's indoctrinated in everything else. You can say that for sexism and classism and you know, the many ableism and heterosexism, like all the gender, you know, everything, the binary. We're a hot mess. And at the end of the day, if we were truly about some of the texts that we claim govern our moral compass, then all this stuff would be cleaved to the side because none of this is in line with that at all. Yeah. Um, so we're all in this together. We all have share this planet. And I think that if we were to realize that looking out for each other really does benefit all of us, boy, wouldn't that be great? But as this masked debacle shows, we're just, we're just not, we're not ready. We have a lot of potential yeah. and I like to be optimistic. But, you know, I think as a species, we're trying. I guess we're still kindergarten. We think we are PhDs in, like, what it is to be humans and to do it well. But what we don't realize is that we're kindergartners. But we're also the kindergartner that's struggling. And I mean that in a sense of, like, you're not sharing. Like, the whole goal today was for you to learn to be nice. Like, how to share. I mean, we're struggling in that way. I'm not, like, learning difficult. I mean, like, how to be human. Mm -hmm. really we're on a basic level as a species but maybe we'll grow but you know i saw this pandemic and i thought we'll come together i know it's very hard i would like to hope that more people than not are in this situation are taking some stock of their lives and right. what's important that's my biggest hope for all of this yeah. i would say that while there are things that i can agree to disagree on things like if people's philosophies and ways of moving through the world are entrenched in things that create violence, oppression, and hardships for others, then we're, I can't agree to disagree on that. What I can say is that I do think people can change. I do think people can have a different perspective and hopefully become more empathetic and understanding. And I hope in that process, they'll see that again, like I said, I'm not an anomaly. What I want for myself, wanting that for others is, is not an anomaly. And at the end of the day, really not just Black Lives Matter. I'm not like an affiliate, a member specifically, but obviously I, I believe in the concept that Black Lives Matter and that we need to struggle as a society to really make that real because all lives are in jeopardy if our lives don't matter. So I think that's important. But I guess I would say that even the folks that maybe one day they're going to really wake up and feel like, wow, actually that billionaire president didn't help me. And that really wasn't in my best interest. And people of color and folks from south of these random borders that we've drawn on a map aren't my enemy. Maybe one day waking up in that, maybe there will be some policies that happen that where people's quality of life throughout the country would be improved through all the things that as people we want and need, right? And then folks would go, oh, this is nice. Mm -hmm. This whole hundreds of years of history would have gone down different. If there was this true fear that like white people becoming a minority in the United States of America would mean that folks of color are going to enslave them and like do retribution and treat them the way they felt they were treated for 400 years, we would have seen that stuff cropping up all over the place. But most of us was just like, can we just live our lives and make a yeah. decent wage and yeah. own some property and not die in debt? Go to the doctor right. without having to owe for 20 years. Most basic, people just want the same yeah. thing. Just basic human needs and rights. Yeah. yeah. We don't have to go the hard route. There's so much research. There's so much information. It's not a mystery. And there's so um, many other examples of it in the world where other countries are doing yeah. it. I think we need to also understand how much we miss out by not allowing everyone to be their best selves and really reach their potential. And that requires everyone having resources. And, you know, and it's not just a cute word, equity. It's really about as a society, we benefit. So what is it for us to just really acknowledge that people deserve to be taken care of? And there's enough resources for everyone to have what they need. And that's the part where I feel like if people are religious, it's so clear. It's like everything is bountiful. It's just, it's, here's a gift. Yeah. Everything you need. 
I just want to say thank you so much for sharing all of that from your heart. And I think that's a great place to leave this right now, especially given the time of year that this episode will drop, seeing what we can do to just be better humans. Yeah. So we all benefit and thrive. And it's free. And it's free. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't cost anything. Maybe that's why it's not catching on. It's just Maybe, not tricky. right. It can't be let's monetized. Put a price tag on it. <laughs> And then people, let's, it's, it's a million dollars. Never be like, oh, I need that. I need, right, how can right. I be a better human yeah. being? <laughs> Give the gift that's free. Be right. kind. Be that's kind. Like, yeah, exactly. Well, thanks again for being here today. I really appreciate it. But before I let you go, I have to pick some numbers out of the magic jar for the random questions that are known as Diary Unlocked. And Diary Unlocked, if you're listening and aren't familiar, is exclusive content available to Patreon supporters of the Desert Lady Diaries podcast. So if you're interested in becoming a Patreon supporter, go to DesertLadyDiaries.com, click on the support page, and learn about the various options available to support this podcast because it is listener supported. I am going to ask Taria, you find a $100 bill on the ground. What do you do with it? Finish this sentence. I've always wanted, was there a trait you recognized in yourself at a young age that you still use or has led you to a particular vocation? And one of your bucket list trips, where would you go and why? So if you're listening and you want to hear Taria's answers to those questions, again, go to DesertLadyDiaries.com, click on the support page and learn how to become a patron of the podcast. Thank you again for being here today. It was really awesome to talk with you. Same. I really enjoyed myself, and I'm really looking forward to answering those questions. Thank you. Shouting out to Paul C. Thanks so much for signing up for the new episode newsletter. If you would like to sign up for the new episode newsletter like Paul did, go to DesertLadyDiaries.com and click on the new episode newsletter button. I will be back with new episodes of the podcast in January 2021. Until then, stay healthy and hopeful and enjoy your holiday season. Thanks so much for listening.